Hi, I'm Jackie Stapleton and welcome to Atoll TV. If you've made it here, it means that you might just love ISO standards as much as I do and are truly interested and possibly excited about learning more about them. Well, you have come to the right place. In this video, I'm going to cover clause 9.2, internal audit. I'm going to break this clause down and turn it into something you can all understand. You'll then be able to apply this to your own organization system and understand what the requirements will look like for you. No more guessing. Keep on watching as I can show you just how easy this is. This clause starts off with subclause 9.2.1, general where it states the organisation shall conduct internal audits at planned intervals to provide information on whether the OHS management system A conforms to 1 the organisation's own requirements for its OHS management system including the OHS policy and OHS objectives 2 the requirements of this document meaning ISO 45001 and B is effectively implemented and maintained. This subclause is spelling out what our internal audits should be conducted against, which is normally referred to as the criteria. Your planned audits should ensure that there are two criteria areas that you audit against and will look something like this. The criteria level is ISO 45001, the system level is your own OHS management system, and the operations level is where you can see it all in action. We then move on to the second subclause of 9.2.2 Internal Audit Program, where it states that the organisation shall plan, establish, implement, and maintain an audit program including the frequency, methods, responsibilities, consultation, planning requirements and reporting, which shall take into consideration the importance of the processes concerned and the results of previous audits. Fantastic! This is pretty clear that we are required to develop an audit program, sometimes referred to as an audit schedule. The audit program should be for all of the audits planned over a period of time. Normally within businesses, you see this over a period of 12 months. For myself, as a certification auditor, my audit programs for clients are over three years, as this ties in with a three-year certification cycle. It is up to the business to determine what time frame the audit program is developed for. The audit program should include some key areas, which are frequency, so when are the audits conducted, which months or weeks and how often. Methods, this may include a reference to a procedure or a report template to be used for the audit. Responsibilities, who is conducting which audits. Consultation, ensure that the process of establishing what is included in your audit program is discussed with workers so that they can have input and provide feedback. Planning requirements and reporting, again, this may reference a separate procedure that internal auditors are to follow when preparing, planning, conducting and reporting on an audit. Taking into account risk, or as this clause says, take into consideration the importance of the processes concerned, this audit program might have the organisation's processes and activities listed and when they are to be audited and by whom. A major part of this is determining which procedures should be audited first or more often as they are high risk. This could be new procedures or procedures related to a new process or location or product. You can see that this audit program should be a risk-based tool that you use to monitor key parts of the business with a focus on the high risk areas. It is more important to conduct audits on areas of higher risk than auditing absolutely everything, even the areas that are low risk and have never had any issues or changes. 
And then finally, when developing your audit program, you should consider the results of previous audits. If there were non-conformances raised in an audit this month, for example, then this should prompt a review of the audit program to ensure that this process or area that attracted the non-conformance is included in the audit cycle again. This ensures that high risk areas, those that have had previous non-conformances, are picked up and reviewed or revisited sooner rather than later. Make sure that your audit program is a living, breathing tool that you use to benefit your business. Before I move on to point B, I want to skip ahead to point F where it states to retain documented information as evidence of the implementation of the audit program and the audit results. This clause requirement confirms that we need a documented audit program. It can't just be in your head. So everything I have talked about so far regarding an audit program, it is in documented form, whether it's hard copy, electronic, or a software program. Then we also require documented information to be retained as evidence of the audit results. So this means we need to see documented evidence of the outcomes of the audits conducted. This could be as simple as an audit report, which you need to ensure includes as per point B, which states to define the audit criteria and scope for each audit. So, in your audit report, you would include a field to document the audit criteria, which is what you are auditing against, which could be a particular ISO clause or standard or even a specific activity or procedure. And then also include a field for the scope of the audit. The scope of the audit is the extent and boundaries. So this could be specific locations, activities, departments, and so on. Then finally, we have points C, select auditors and conduct audits to ensure objectivity and the impartiality of the audit processes. D, ensure that the results of the audits are reported to relevant managers, ensure that relevant audit results are reported to workers and where they exist, workers' representatives and other relevant interested parties. To summarise these two final points, don't audit your own work. So if you generate the evidence within the scope of the audit, then you shouldn't be auditing that area. You need to ensure another auditor who is impartial and has no conflict of interest is assigned to that audit in your audit program. And then once you have completed your audit report, ensure that it is provided to relevant management within the business as well as communicated and shared with workers and any other relevant interested party, which could be customers or suppliers. And then finally, we have E, take action to address non-conformities and continually improve its OH&S performance, see clause 10. Therefore, ensure that you follow your corrective action process when non-conformances are identified as a result of the audit. To understand what is required for your non-conformance and corrective action process, be sure to refer to the video for clause 10.2. Now that I've explained all of these requirements, can you see more clearly how you could action and demonstrate these requirements in your own management system? Thank you so much for joining me. Clearly, you are truly dedicated to learning more about ISO standards. I love having you learn with me and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Auditor Training Online is a recognized training provider and we know how it works in the real world. So we are confident that we can help you to make a change in your life and join the most sought after profession out there. Go to our website and enroll in our training to transform your work and industry experience into a recognized qualification and career. And also, don't forget to subscribe to Atoll TV and leave a comment or question as I truly do want to help you to join the best career out there with me.